Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Welcome to a help desk ticketing crash course. If you have friends that are interested in this type of stuff too, please let them know as this is premiering right now. All right, guys, we have a lot to cover. This is going to be about hour and a half. So sit back, relax. If you want to get some coffee or something to drink, now is a good time. And while you're getting a snack or a drink, please take one second out of your time to like this video. I really appreciate it. And with that being said, let's get right into it. So first ticket is based off my feedback that I got from Eddie. Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, you know who you are. Thank you so much uh, for giving me an idea for this ticket. So let's have a look. And the first ticket here says, I can't log in to my computer and the error is domain not available. So the reporter name is Mike Moser and Mike here says, please help me. I only get an error domain not available when attempting to log in. So I'll log into his computer, right? I am able to log in using my phone app to contact help desk. So I don't think it's my password. So here's what's going on. Uh, this user, whenever they try to log into their computer, they simply just get this message. It says domain not available. And there are a couple of different reasons for this to happen. And the first one is the computer simply needs to be joined the, the, the domain that it belongs to. So that way it doesn't get this error. And the second uh, reason for it is that computer is simply not connected to the network of any sort, you know, physically. Um, if it's a computer that is like work from home type of computer, where it simply needs a network or internet connection, chances are this would not happen. Although it may, I've seen that happen as well. But generally speaking, when it's work from home, uh, this would not necessarily happen. Uh, but the, the reason you would the second reason you would get this is when you're not physically connected to the network that the computer belongs to uh, when it comes to the domain itself. Okay, now I digress. Let me tell you what domain is. There are a couple of different domains, right? There is a first domain that you can think of, right? Here's, for example, cosmicnova.com. That's one example of a domain. Cosmicnova.com is literally name of the domain. It's also known as the website, right? So that's that. However, it's different from a business environment. Business environment has its own domain, which all the computers on that network are joined to specifically. And that is found under computer properties. So this is just one way of getting to it. It doesn't matter which way you get to it as long as you get to it. But if you right click this PC, for example, or just go to system settings, you can just type in system settings or something like that. And it will get to this point. And the the part where you want to look at is here where it says computer name, domain, and work group settings. This computer is on a local home network and it's joined this work group here where it says new server zero. When a business environment, it would literally say domain here instead of work group and it would give you the name of the domain, which looks like this here. This computer here, so this computer here, if we look at the same settings, you can see that it literally says here domain instead of work group, and it gives you the name of the domain. You, have, you see how it says here tech support dot coboman dot com. It's kind of similar to what we saw as a website, for, for example, cosmicnova.com that I showed you, but it's different. This is just for the business. That's the name of the business. And that's what is going on with this ticket. Again, let me show you here comparison real quick. This is what my local computer looks like. You see it says work group instead of domain, but then this one here, here it says domain. So if the issue here is, I'm just gonna minimize this here. If the issue here is that this user's computer needs to be added to the domain, this is how you would do it. You would go back to the system and you would go to advanced system settings and then under computer name here the very first tab you will get an option to change computer name and then if you look down here where it says to rename this computer or change its domain or work group click change and then you would select literally change select domain and then type in what was it tech support dot dot com is that what we had here? I know we did. 
I just want to show you that it is in that tech support dot coboman dot com minimize this real quick and then we're going to click OK and after that you have to reboot the computer see it's not going to do it now because this is a local computer and the other one is just a virtual machine but you would get a notification it says do you want to join this computer to this domain if you do something like that it's been a while since I actually manually had to do this it's super rare but I digress it would say it, you would have to reboot afterwards and then it would be added and it would here would say it would say domain instead of work group and it would be tech support dot dot com now there is a there are other reasons why this might happen it could be just an error in the in the system itself the operating system but another reason also could be is that this computer is not physically connected to the network where the domain is located so if it's like a business environment let's say it's a large building and the computer gets this error um, you know it's either what I said before is that either it's not added to the domain or it doesn't exist on the domain or it's not physically connected so you might want to check the cable just adding a quick note while editing this video this can also happen whenever user receives a new computer and they don't log into it before taking it home meaning that you have to be connected to the domain for your first login so we can create a domain based login or local profile for that user this is why this error happens otherwise at home they can just use their password and log in locally even though it's not connected to the network or domain of any sort uh, th these are the only things I can think of right now when it comes to this error and that's is how I would deal with this specific issue so if this user is at an office I would physically go there and um, you know make sure that the computer is you know plugged in if 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 it's, if it's a guy that's literally within the same building I know some people do tech support or you know desktop support or whatever in a building where there's like I don't know 100 users 200 500 doesn't matter they can physically go to their computer and check all these settings make sure they are added I can't think of any other way to do this instead of having physical access because you can't log in so you can't really take uh, control remotely if this is somebody who's working from home for example and this really shouldn't be happening when somebody's working from home and the reason I'm uh, mentioning working from home is because obviously a lot of people are going to working from home especially in the current situation but I've seen it happen couple of times and for each one of those times user had to bring the computer back uh, to the office or you know location where you can actually make these changes the reason being is so you can physically connect it to the network so that way you can re-add it in there um, using a local admin so by the way in order to make those changes wherever that I showed you in there when you go to advanced settings to add the computer uh, in this case you might have to do it using local administrator privileges and uh, it depending on the business setup business environment you may be able to because here's what happened in order to for you to do it remotely to add the computer back to the domain which still may not work properly because they're working from home but let's say you are somehow doing it you would have to get local admin uh, login so that you can actually log into computer to begin with and then make the changes here right you'd go in and make the changes otherwise you have no other way of doing it and you would have to literally have the user type in all the information and you would literally have to guide them to do it and you know whether your company allows this type of thing realistically it's best to just have them bring it to the tech guy at their office and just have him deal with it but hey every company has different rules maybe you are allowed to do this maybe you are allowed to share this information uh, local admin uh, password uh, with with the, <laughs> with the user I don't know uh, but this is how you would go about resolving this okay so I'm just gonna reply to him and say uh, well first of all I would talk to him I would talk to him on the phone and uh, make sure that this indeed is the error and that he can't log in any other way and uh, I'm just gonna say in this case just to be safe okay uh, can you please bring back the computer 
to the office so we can fix it. And you can provide details typically on a ticket when you're adding um, internal notes or any notes you want to be specific. Uh, in this case, I don't necessarily want to be specific if I'm just talking to them. But since I'm talking to them on the phone, I highly suggest that you do talk to them on the phone. Uh, if you can't, you know, if it's again, if it's not at the local office, make sure that uh, they're already aware why you want men, why you want them to bring it back. At, at least give them that. Doesn't matter whether I understand it or not. Uh, this just tell them this is what you have to do, and this is how we can fix it. You know, and then I'm just gonna say computer needs to be added to domain. And again, this is all with the assumption that I'm talking to the customer. I already talked to them and ensured them uh, that this is going to get fixed and how I'm going to go about it. So I'm just putting down basic information and instead of just, you know, this is just a formality at this point. Okay. So we're going to wait for the customer to um, come back. By the way, I forgot to assign this ticket to myself. I've really got into it. It's been a while since I, I made some of these help desk ticket based videos. So yeah, make sure you assign the you know ticket to yourself, and uh, we're gonna get back to it, and possibly route it to the local IT tech support people. Depending on how your computer or, or how your tech support is set up, you may have to route this ticket to them. But in this case, he's just gonna bring it to me, and I'm going to just resolve it. All right. Next ticket, it's thanks to uh, feedback from this gentleman on Discord. Uh, let me show you here. Well, first of all, let's uh, let's read the ticket. It's the ticket that I created based off of uh, his feedback and idea. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, is I forgot to change my password and now I can't log in. And it's kind of specific here in description. It says, "Hi, I forgot to change my password last Friday, and over the weekend my password expired. I can't log in to change." So it's kind of specific to the way why he can't log in. It says, I forgot to change my password last Friday and over the weekend my password expired and I can't log in to change it. Usually, usually customers or users would get notifications on when the password is about to expire. And I've also seen where, you know, user either forgets or just kind of ignores it because sometimes you just get one notification. I've seen that too. It's only one notification like 14 days before it expires or something like that. Uh, and uh, and that will be pretty much it and then they forget about it. But the reason I made this specific ticket is in a scenario that this gentleman on Discord described to me. Again, I appreciate your help. And here it is what he says, Mr. RTM, thank you. And it says, if I catch a help desk call and user wanting to reset their password, uh, I'm sorry, if I catch a help desk call and a user wanting to reset their password uh, to easily guess passwords such as password or password 123, I advise them that their desired password is not very secure to coach them and how to make the password more without driving them crazy or resort to writing it down somewhere. So he's giving an example of how he's handling um, password resets whenever he uh, works basically a help desk uh, call. Or I'm assuming, at, from what I gathered, he works at a location where he probably takes turn, and he can correct me if I'm wrong here, he probably takes turn on basically on answering a help desk call that probably comes through their central line for the tech support guys at, at uh, locally probably there. And then he says, offsite users do not get system notifications of when their password will expire. You see, this is something I kind of touched on. I've seen it. Usually, Windows will just say your password and you get a pop-up notification. And it kind of goes away to the side and a lot of people don't see it. But in this case, they don't get any notifications, which is something wrong with the system. To help with this, I let them know when the new password will expire, expire and we built expiration date into the new password. Uh, so he has to let them know. Uh, but see, I'm not sure if he means that he set the system to do this, but I don't, I don't think so. Because uh, from when I talked to him further down, it didn't, didn't seem to be the case. 
and then it says here for example if the new password would expire on 12 16 we might use something like this password without quotation marks so he's given me a really good example of a short but a secure password this is a really good uh, password it has a combination of with the asterisk as a symbol and then combination of uh, numbers and then it says i tell them with i tell them about one of the passwords checking checking sites and on one of the sites the password check results are that that would be take computer 23 years okay so he's basically giving an example of hey this is a secure password it's really simple to remember but if you want to test your password on how long it would take to crack you know he's basically uh, saying that uh, to the user that the password is very secure they don't necessarily have to worry about it and uh, it says our password lasts 90 days which is normal before the account gets disabled so the new password is strong enough and it's not uh, so complex that they would struggle with it the password also checks all the requirements for the password complexity so yeah this is a really good password um, the, what i find interesting about this is that he is given him permanent passwords typically in a business environment uh, what you want to do is give him a temporary password it, it again it, this, this highly depends on the environment on what business prefers uh, but when it comes to security you you realistically you realistically want to give him a temporary password in active directory so if we go to active directory here again and uh, again i'm sorry well again well yeah again because i made a lot more videos about active directory and uh, <laughs> so yeah it's again and uh, it's just kind of finicky here i had to send them send it to alt control delete so i can get to the login part of it anyway so when you typically go in and let's find mike moser here mike moser and you know somebody says my password is expired you would just basically change their password and give them a temporary password meaning that whatever i type in here for the new password i confirm password and then leave this checked which is checked by default it says user must change password and next log on it's a temporary password so whenever they log in they will create their own hopefully in a perfect world a secure password like this gentleman suggested but since in his uh, situation in his business the notifications for the password expiration has been expired and probably for some other reasons too uh, probably because they can't log in uh, he has to give them a permanent this is i'm assuming these are remote well here it, it is say off-site users these are all remote users so they can't uh, type in the new temporary password in at all uh, because their current computer will only take their old password so chances are they can log into the computer but they can't uh, change their password at all so the computer wouldn't even register because it's not connected to the vpn all, uh, vpn at all and it's not connected to the domain it doesn't have access to the to, to the business network i'm sorry one more note man this goes to show that there are so many things that can go wrong that to think about when it comes to resolving these type of issues but another reason person cannot log in to vpn to change their password is because when your password expire your account is locked so your vpn will not allow you to log in at all this is why he is giving them permanent passwords which enables their account once more so he doesn't realize that the password has been reset or changed at all so he has to give him a permanent password which is something i've done and still do occasionally because this is the only way and then later on i offered him uh, an option to actually change their password again uh, but once they're connected to the vpn then they can set it to whatever they want so this is the setup that they have over there and which is fine this is how his business runs things you know however technically speaking it's a security risk to for him um, also to know the password for all the users you know and again i mean this is technically speaking you know what i mean if the user is fine with that um you know that's fine this is a very secure password and if the business uh, gives 100 percent trust to the tech support guys there 
that's perfectly fine too. Who am I to judge? But technically speaking, uh, it's more secure to uh, give them for them to have their own password. I, I mean, you can argue this back and forth. Uh, I can see, uh, I, I can argue for both sides either way, as you can tell. But you know, in this case, this is what's uh, this is the situation for this gentleman. And then it says here, users. And then I asked them uh, because I wanted to clarify. Uh, does this user not get a password notification on VPN? And then, and then I realized that they were off-site. So chances are they wouldn't even get it. Uh, but because the, the the notifications are not working to begin with for some reason, so even before it expired, they didn't get it. But of course, if they're not on VPN at all, it's not gonna. You know what I mean? It's what is there to send if there is no connection? What is there to send a notification if there is no connection? Just like you get notifications for YouTube or any other website, you have to have network connection. In, in that case, would be outside internet. So and it says here, users uh, used to get notifications at the login prompt, but that quit a few years ago, and our company, uh, our company went to a password page, uh, page off of our internet site. So I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about here, but I suspect it's some kind of website where you can just use a single sign-on. There are some websites that are set up to be reached uh, just over the internet company website that you can use your domain login. And uh, like that, you can uh, access basically, you know, company resources without actually having a some company's resources, not necessarily the network itself. But through the website, which is kind of a proxy in this sense here, a proxy way of getting to something on the uh, for the on, on the company, um, there is usually a website that's set up that you can access just using your credentials. A lot of times they're just SSO credentials, meaning single sign-on. The other issue we found was that the users get got confused in the Windows login, and it was prompting for a change. So we pretty much advised them if they get a notification to get to go to the internet site for now. So yeah, it looks like they have some kind of a website set up for that to help them deal with these password issues and to check, probably to check, let them check uh, when their password is going to expire. We are implementing a ping SSO system that should complete later this year. Um, and uh, But the awareness training of a secure password doesn't drive you crazy like sticks with them and, and crazy sticks with them. Um, so yeah, so he basically goes around and trains and he mentions this uh, users that you can have a secure password without actually having it be too complicated. And it says, I actually teach this in a security awareness training in the new employee orientations. So he's a really good guy. He's going above and beyond when it comes to teaching passwords, past security, basically. I also plan on taking a laptop um, on a rolling cart throughout the hospital and spend a few hours just letting users come up and check their complexity of their current passwords. So he also plans uh, to go around. He, you know, th this is really cool actually. I work, uh, right now I'm working from home because of the whole situation, but I also work in a building. It's kind of a campus type of building with three built buildings connect together. And that's pretty cool when you can actually, you know, grab a cart, put your laptop on and just go around and just help people. You know, that's really cool and fun. And then he's going to do that. He's going to go around and have people check the complexity. And I have a feeling that what he's talking about here is that he has a password uh, testing website that he they can go in and type in their password and it will, tech their, it will test the complexity or security of their password, which is pretty cool. And... Um, and then he says, if it's not very complex, I show them how to improve and still be easy to remember. Yeah, this is really cool. I, I really like his feedback and just different way on how he's dealing with things uh, when it comes to tech support. It's very interesting and a bit different from the things uh, that are done, the way things are done uh, in, 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 the, in my particular business environment, but nonetheless still valid in my opinion. And then he goes to talk about we have outside clinics that are not part of a hospital or have remote access to our patient records and have stress uh, have stress password security for with everyone. And I stress password security with everyone. That's cool. I like 
that. And then their help desk um, is aware of this, uh, probably practices the same type of thing. And that was pretty much it. I kind of uh, tried to get more understanding of what's going on, but then and and then why the basically issue wasn't addressed to begin with which in this case is the fact that they're not getting notifications for the password resets in his environment but it's something that he can't help a lot of times we are limited even if we want to help we are limited in a company that um, that doesn't necessarily want you to mess with things that are above your pay grade or don't give you the tools to do it you know so the way i would deal with this issue is same way i would actually uh, call them and talk to them especially if they're a remote user and set up this password just like he did it i would give him a permanent password i, I made actually a video about this and which i dealt it with the same way um, it was a i think the video is called vpn password or something like that I highly suggest to, uh, for you to actually watch this if you're interested in this specifically as I expand on that um, in that video as well and how you would uh, deal with that. But yeah, if you know if the password has expired and they can't change it, I would do the same thing as this gentleman. I would give them a, a permanent password and uh, offer them to uh, basically reset their password again so that they can get a prompt to change it again you know give them a temporary pass but this is after they log into the computer with the permanent password that i've given him just like that gentleman explained and then assuming that i'm talking to them on the phone i'm just going to call this uh, i'm going to give it an internal note for my boss i've reset user's password and just call it that i'm not going to leave anything else there because it's it's uh redundant um that's all i've done that's all there is to it if management is completely aware in these type of situations that uh if you somebody's on a vpn and they can't change their password this is how you would do it you know there's no other way unless there's some kind of weird system setup and uh yeah i mean that's all there is to it for this particular ticket we have a couple of tickets we're going to work but before we do that please take one second out of your time to click the like button i really appreciate it, it means a lot to me the first one we're going to actually work is this one here where it says my printer is not working typically you want to work tickets that are in order for example this one says isd 34 and this one says isd 35 but the reason i'm going to work the ISD 35 first is because it's in relation to suggestion or something that somebody from my Discord actually asked and I kind of made it into my own idea, I guess. All right, let's see who said this. So a couple of days ago, I asked for suggestions on my help desk training videos, basically ideas for tickets or issues that I can work on or talk about because I really need more ideas, guys. I have over 420 videos or something like that. So chances are I've covered majority of topics. So I'm always open for those. And please don't forget to let me know if you have any ideas or anything that you want me to talk about, whether it's in the comments section below this video or on discord if you want to join my discord there is a link in the description so the idea i got for the other one for the printer ticket is from mr rookie bob so bob said is there a way to tell if device device if device drivers are installed correctly short of a device manager and he said had an old machine that i restalled uh, that i reinstalled and is network uh, wouldn't connect via ethernet and device manager said the driver was up to date had to manually download from the site and install before it started working so basically what's going on here he's saying that uh, everything looked fine in the device manager uh, when it comes to the ethernet adapter that he had installed and let me show you how that looks like so if i go to the device manager and a look at the device manager and in this case what was happening under the ethernet uh, everything looked fine but yet ethernet did not work by the way thank you very much bob 
uh, for uh, basically give me that suggestion, which I kind of made into a printer issue. But I will talk about specifically what you mentioned. So he said network adapter looked fine. So in this case, for example, we have Intel R Ethernet connection adapter. And that's the physical one. The other ones here is for the virtual box and one for Hyper-V. So they're virtual adapters that are tunneled, uh, that tunnel to the Intel R Ethernet, which is the physical one. So what he's talking about, that it looked normal. Everything looked normal. There are no um, issues in device manager. What usually happens is when you have an error, uh, in, when, when driver didn't install properly or something doesn't install at all, in device manager, usually on the bottom here, there would be a list of things with exclamation marks on them. In his case, it looked fine, but it still didn't work. So if you look at it, properties, uh, you know, everything looked fine. It says device started working properly, this and that. But it didn't start working until he actually went to the website for the specific hardware that he has and installed that specific driver. And this can happen uh, when uh, Windows operating system installs generic drivers. And uh, it used to be worse before. And uh, you can see here, he mentioned it's an older machine. So chances are it's an older operating system as well. It has gotten better with Windows 10, with Windows 10 operating system uh, because of the whole plug and play thing gotten better. Although they started suggesting that I think in Windows XP times, maybe even earlier, maybe Windows 2000 or something like that. Basically uh, what I had to tell him is there's no way, there's no easy way to tell aside there's no easy way to tell aside from assuming that the wrong driver is installed. So yeah, if it doesn't work and it looks normal in the device manager, then chances are you have to go and actually download or update that driver specifically for that specific piece of hardware, whether it's ethernet adapter, a graphics card, sound card, or anything like that. And then I said, I've noticed Windows OS likes to install generic drivers that sometimes do not work even though looks normal in device manager. So that goes back to me saying or talking about generic drivers or basic drivers that they use. Uh, I guess generic would be more a technical term. And this usually uh, especially true with older hardware, but it has gotten way better with Windows 10. Okay, now let's segue into this. So yeah, basically to just kind of wrap this up, you would update your driver or install this driver package specifically for your computer, for your computer model or this and that. Okay, now let's hit the printer ticket because it's kind of in relation to that. Again, make sure you assign to this to yourself when you're working these tickets. This is a JIRA ticketing system. And if you want to know or learn how to use this ticketing system, I have a specific video on how to use a ticketing system. In this case, we are just troubleshooting things. This ticket says here, my printer is not working. And it says I've installed, I've in, I'm trying to highlight it from the beginning. I've installed, whatever, I'm just going to highlight the whole thing. I've installed the printer this morning and there are no driver errors, but still not working. Please help me. Debbie. So, Debbie says here she installed the printer and there are no driver errors. So just like we looked at it before, she would install it and let's go to, I almost went back to the device manager, but we actually need printers and scanners, which shows our printers that are installed. And this is how it looks like in Windows 10. It looks different. And there is a way to actually see them listed differently in older operating systems. But in this tutorial, we're actually just going to do it the way Windows 10 wants us to do it, right? So here we are, printers and scanners. And here's a printer that's installed here. So we're going to look at it as in like, okay, well, it looks fine. looks like it's installed. There are no exclamation marks, or I should say there are no errors. There are no big red X's or anything like that. It looks normal and this is exactly what it's going on with users computer as well she installed the printer and it looks fine however sometimes printers can also be set to use generic drivers so let's look at how we can actually adjust this so she chances are just installed the software package on her computer somehow or through the means of whatever the company allows and uh, it looks fine but yet it's still not installed this can happen with printers that are, for example, uh, printers that allow multiple 
drivers to be used so including generic and the one specific to the printer itself so a generic printer should work printer driver should work but then it also gives you an option to change it to the specific to that printer that you have so i know this sounds confusing but what happens is for example a large printer maker what they would do uh, they would create a global print driver for example xerox and that global print driver will work a uh, printer driver will work for majority of the xerox printers that are out there or at least a group of them maybe not all of them but at least a group of them aside from that they have specific and different drivers including drivers that support different functions of the printers including including secure print meaning that you are let's say you're working in an office and there are hundreds of people working there and you decide to print something and everybody is printing on the same large xerox printer one of those big ones big boxed ones that are like 10 or twenty thousand dollars printers but you have to walk across the entire office floor to get to it and then of course if it's a secure document it's like some kind of sensitive information let's say a contract of some sort you don't want everybody just to see it so you set up secure print and then you once you go there to the printer you type in your code and you get your print out when you get there not doesn't print out and then you go over there and searching through the all the other printouts or maybe somebody takes it you know what i mean that's the point of having multiple drivers available uh for specific for for printers right so you can choose between different ones in this case we're just going to look at the basic thing that we can with this canon one again this is a canon mp250 it's just a basic uh fairly affordable printer that you can use at home i don't have access since i'm working from home at the moment i don't have access to the large xerox one to show you different uh drivers that are available but maybe if we're on luck where we can find something here uh, that's similar so you would usually go to something like advanced and select a printer driver like so you can see here that under printer properties it gives me an option if available to select a different driver or even install a new one in this case it's grayed out unfortunately because this printer is literally has a specific printer it, it's not a xerox twenty thousand dollar printer guys you know what i mean but at least i am able to show you where you can do so so unlike example of the inter ethernet adapter um, that uh, bob is it bob yes bob that bob mentioned uh in his case he literally has to use a specific one and the generic printer in that case it looked like it was normal but it wasn't however it, when it comes to printers you can have and expect to see different printer drivers that you literally select and it's very simple uh, once you install it if it's not available there you simply use this drop down and select the one that you know that might work and sometimes you may have to actually experiment experiment with that so uh, you know make sure that you select the one and the select the one that is literally what customer wants so if debbie here wants to use a secure printer uh, features she may have to select a specific driver that allows for that if she debbie wants to print in color she may have to use a specific driver for that very important to know when it comes to dealing with printer stuff like this okay so i guess i'm going to reply to her and you know what in this case i would actually call her and ask her all this information because it's again it's not very simple and i hope it's simple to understand i hope it came across as simple to understand to you guys uh, because there really isn't necessarily a simple way of explaining it but i would talk to her on the phone and ask her debbie uh what kind of printer well, what are you going to use the printer for basically and then she would tell me and then based off of that i would set up her printer drivers and then we would call it that so i guess since i'm talking to her i don't have to reply to her so for that i'm just going to add internal note and say configured printer as requested by user slash customer Irvin. save and then I'm going to complete it. All right. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Please take one moment to like it. 
I appreciate it. I know I already said it, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. All right. Let's look at one more. And uh, that should make a for a nice, nice uh, session, nice training session for us, guys. Here we are again. If you watch my other videos, we have again Mike Moser. Mike Moser's got a lot of problems with his computers. He's always <laughs> uh, putting in tickets. Anyways, here we go. I am getting computer errors and PC reboots. And it says, this morning I am unable to use programs and computer restarts. I had to reboot four times. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And it says, I work from home, so please call me. So in this case, I would call Mike. And of course, just a touch on this, Debbie, I would ask Debbie if, if she was like on Instant Messenger, I would ask her, hey, can I call you? You know, but you know, in this case, Mike specifically said, that I can just call him. So I'm going to call Mike. So I'm going to call Mike and ask him exactly what is going on. So chances are that everything is okay. He says here, I had to uh, reboot four times. So chances are that everything is okay at this time. But of course we would double check this with customer slash user. But the fact that he's working from home and that he had to reboot four times and then he said that I'm he says I am unable to use programs and computer restarts to me right away my intuition my experience tells me that one uh, he's unable to use programs uh, because chances are maybe he is not connected to the VPN first and then he's trying to open these programs that require external connection or external access um, from his from his home from his home connection and then we got computer restart so maybe he is turning off his computer whenever he's done using it so it's not able to uh, install updates or anything like that so i would make sure that he indeed is keeping the computer turned on while after he uses it because updates come overnight usually and then i would see which programs are unable to connect and if he's telling me that he is trying to use these programs before he connects to vpn then chances are he's not doing it right so this may be a training issue of course get on the computer and see if there are any issues but chances are if he says everything is fine then what can you do i specifically created this ticket um, so that way i can show you an example of uh, something that you have to do as pc support and that is training sometimes you have to train people on how to use computers properly so what i'm going to do and i'm, I'm talking to the customer but i'm just going to type here what i'm going to tell him I'm going to say, okay, good morning. And then I'm going to ask him, do you turn off your computer at the end of shift or meaning at the end of day, then once he's done working or do you keep it on and then if he says i turn it off or shut down then i would say please go scroll up a little bit please ensure please i'm going to say this i'm going to be nice because i don't want to be you know i don't know who mike is if mike is a manager i don't want to talk to him like he's lesser than me so if i say please ensure that then he may not take this as in like he may not actually do it you know what I mean? uh, please leave computer on after work so that it can get updates uh, this will minimize reboots I'm gonna say restarts because he said restarts and will allow for faster login 
Okay, so especially true when you're working from home, you want to make sure that user knows that it's best to leave the computer on. And if they're like, well, yeah, it's using too much power and this and that, I'm just going to say, well, it actually uses very little power when it's not being used. And we're going to say that as well. But but the point is, we want to make sure that the computer gets all of its updates first. So if he rebooted four times, chances are that at least two of those times, or let's say at least one or two times, that the computer was just wanting to reboot, no matter what, he, whether he did it manually or not whether he rebooted on his own to resolve issues or anything like that, it doesn't matter. We want to make sure that the computer reboots during after business hours when he's not using it. And then if he says, well, when I rebooted, it took forever and this, that, well, that's because maybe it was getting updates, you know, or the computer is slow, but chances are it was just getting updates. And then I would also say, uh, just to make them feel better off because you know some people are um, for the lack of better words anal they really want to do things their own way because this or that they, and if, if some people think that the computer is using a lot of electricity they may not want to keep the computer you know turned on when they're not using it and I'm gonna say computer uses very little power when not in use it, it's kind of wordy what i said there but it gets the point across and then i'm gonna say it uses around eight watts compared to a light bulb uh, which is around 60 w's so this kind of puts them at ease They leave the computer on because 8 watts is just very, very little. And I compare it to something they can understand because people, a lot of people don't understand what watts are. What are watts? And what is that, you know? But if I compare it to a light bulb, a standard light bulb, um, they're going to say, well, 8 watts is really nothing, which is completely true. I actually have a power a meter that's plugged into my wall and my custom-made computer has a lot more stuff than uh, these... Uh, you know, computers that are from company like these basic small form factor computers, uh, it still only use around eight to 10 watts on just idle, you know, with, with monitor turned off. Monitor itself can use some power as well. Okay, and then I'm going to say, so let's assume Mike said, okay, no problem. You know what I mean? And then I can say, to kind of minimize what he was talking about here where it says i am unable to use programs chances are that uh you know he didn't log into vpn first and then things happened or things didn't work so i'm gonna say a good a good way to ensure programs work properly when working from home is to is to log in in this order so i'm going to give him a basic instructions on the safe way to log in when working from home so i would say log in to vpn first then your ip phone because you know he's working from home so chances are he's using ip phone and then everything else this will ensure uh, well let's i don't want to say safe but I'm going to say, you know, let's let's make it full fancy, pro, active, uh, blah, 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 let's see. <laughs> this will ensure proactive workday. How is that? A proactive, this will ensure a proactive workday. So 
that should help and give basic instructions because we always want to log into VPN first. Everything else that requires connections like an IP phone or anything else uh, will depend heavily on VPN being logged in first. Because chances are when people log into computer, they start to log into everything at once. Some companies even have like automatic, have software that automatically logs you into like 20 different systems. And sometimes that stuff even starts to execute upon logging to computer because it's set up to do so while you're at the office, while you're physically connected to the network and it can do that. You know, you would imagine you log into your computer, you know, you lock your computer, you log into it and then suddenly things start to execute. <laughs> That's the automatic login system that they have in place. And when you're on VPN, none of that stuff is going to work or I'm sorry, when you're working from home, none of that stuff is going to work. You have to get on VPN first and then it's going to work. So, you know, it, it's kind of a touchy type of thing that you have to kind of be nice about when it comes to explaining. Otherwise, Mike is gonna come back to me and say, things are not working again the next day. So we have to make sure that that's minimized and that that's not happening. But if we provide training, especially if it's somebody let's say Mike already had an issue yesterday and then you already helped them and here is Mike contacting you again you know we want to make sure that you know that you know he knows how to do things properly so that he can minimize issues that are happening there all right guys if you got one second please click the like button and if possible share the video as well I really appreciate it it really means a lot to me all right let's get right into it and we're going to work the first ticket here that says can't cannot add a printer and it just says error dot 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 and this issue is coming from our friend Mike Moser if you're familiar with my video series you know that Mike Moser has a lot of computer issues so we're going to work that work his ticket again uh, and he says here when I tried to add a printer I get attached error so let's see what this error is and here we go it's a big error it says Windows can't open add printer the local print spooler service is not running. Please restart the spooler or restart the machine. So I know that a lot of you who are watching this, who already know a lot of things about help desk, you probably learn about print spooler service. What that means usually is that you can't add a printer because the service has been stopped. And yes, you can simply enable the service. But why does this error come up to begin with? The reason for it usually is if a company decides to put restrictions on using the printer or adding the printer to certain users, to certain groups within the company. The reason for that is security. They don't want you to just necessarily add a printer and start to print secure stuff that belongs to the company. For example, account numbers, uh, personal information, all of that stuff is a security risk unless you have a type of job within that company that requires you to do this. So printing is usually very restricted in a lot of organizations and this is the error that you would get when you try to add a printer. So let's see what that looks like. Devices, printers and scanners, devices, Man, they have so many different ways of getting to this point within Windows 10. Before, it used to be simple. You just go to add a new device or something like that. So here is our printers and scanners in Windows 10. So if we click add a printer and um, it's going to, what it does right now, it just kind of looks for an available printer that's available on the network or locally. If there is nothing there and if you're installing it for the first time, chances are nothing will come up. You may get a list of network printers that are available but the chances are it may not be something that's right next to you. So let's say you work for a company that has, you know, two large buildings. Let's say it's just one building and there are three different floors and all of those floors have to all together have 10 different printers. You will get a list of 10 different printers. And if they're not labeled correctly, you won't necessarily be able to add a correct printer. You don't want to add a printer when you work on first floor. Uh, but you add a printer that's on a third floor, you know, it doesn't make sense. So what usually happens, and this time nothing came up because there's, there are no network printers added or visible, at least. Uh, we have to click uh, the printer that I wasn't, that I want isn't listed. And this is what happens. Otherwise, you would get a classic Windows 
uh, pop-up where it lets you add a printer. And this is what Mike is getting, Windows Can't Open Add Printer. So we know it's the print services or print spooler service that is not running. So we know that we have to go in and enable it. And that's perfectly fine. But there is something that I really want you to keep in mind. There are two different types of services. If you go to your task manager, the very last tab is services, right? These are the services. But there is another section here where it says open services. And this one is different from the services in task manager. It's completely different. So you're wondering, well, why? What do you mean? They're both named services. So what's the difference? First difference that you visually see is you can see that there are things listed on the left side here and that are not listed on the right side and vice versa. For example, on the task manager services, you can see there is AARSVC and it's agent activation runtime. And you can see that as a first thing that comes up here, it's not that, it's ActiveX installer. And it's completely different. And you can see that I have it sorted by name, so that way you can see it here in, a, in an alphabetical order. So what's the difference here? So if I go into the services of the task manager and I just look for a print spooler, right? It's called print spooler. It's not there. But why is that? Look at this. There's print notify, there's print workflow, there's another print workflow, and there are no other print things. You can see clearly that we are sorted alphabetically and there's no way we, we are missing when it comes to, uh, there's no way that, that we're not finding it in here uh, unless it's just completely gone. However, if we go to this other services, which is, is the system services, and we just type in print, spooler it comes up right away and then again if you compare here you can see that there are missing things there it's not it's not there but why is that well the task manager print services is print services specifically for the user that's logged into this computer it's not system services at all and these services do not require administrator privileges for you to start them or stop them or do whatever you want with them. This is all for the user that specifically log into this, not the administrator services. The administrator services is this one here, and that's the one you want to activate the print spooler system. And then of course you can just simply right click it and start it. You see how I was explaining to you uh, this in a specific way to make sure that you don't waste your time looking for certain things or for example in this case services in the wrong place we have two different things completely two different things that are named exactly the same thing that's very confusing in in my in, in my point of view especially for somebody who is new to computers so keep that in mind all of this stuff that's in task manager it's only for the user that's logged in currently that has the privileges to do so meaning people that don't have admin privileges you can do whatever you want but the system services you need to have administrative privileges to do anything with that all right so if we go in here and then we click the printer that i wasn't listed you will get normal pop-up where you can just literally add any printer whether it's tcp ip local or this and that but the error was specific to service being stopped like this, not necessarily disabled. So in an environment where they really want you to uh, make sure, they, when they really want to make sure that the user is not allowed to print, period, unless specifically given the right to do so, or for example, it goes to higher ups and they say you can, it's going to be like this. It's no, it won't be just stopped. In this case, we can just start it because we don't know why it stopped to begin with so we can just simply start it no big deal right but in a business environment where it's disabled you will go to properties for the print spooler like this and it will be like this it will be disabled permanently it will not be able to start up 
on on windows startup at all it would just simply be disabled and they wouldn't be able to get anywhere with that and for that you have to be very careful whether you are allowed to um, enable or not in our case it was just stopped so all we did was just right click and start it and by the way you can start these services remotely let me show you something real quick if we open services and we can ask mike uh mike hey can you give me your computer name or your computer ip address we can open services on our computer on our own computer and uh, select action connect to another computer type in mike's computer name and then click ok it's going to connect to it and then you will basically get a same pop-up like this and then you just go in and remotely start his service of course he can try to reboot and that might start it as well because keep in mind it's just stopped it's not disabled but if it's disabled he can reboot thousand times it's not going to do anything so now since we are uh, since we've uh, enabled his service, we can say, Hello, Mike. I have enabled printing on your computer. Please try again and let me know if any issues, Irvin. Okay, so we're gonna click save. Now he can try again. He can he'll let us know if there are any issues, and that should resolve it. Hopefully, we hear back from him. Sometimes you don't want to necessarily leave it open ended like this. Uh, if you know that this guy is really good at getting back to you on things, that's fine. But you can reach out to him and say, "Hey, can you try again right now?" And if he says it's okay, then we can just go to add internal note printing now works fine and then we're going to close ticket afterwards but notice how i said enabled printing on your computer i'm not going to tell him hey i have enabled print spooler system on your computer users don't necessarily need to know any of this stuff unless they specifically ask because sometimes they're curious maybe know a little bit about computers so they want to know how how you did it you know uh, but otherwise you can just say i've enabled printing on your computer please try again and then we're going to mark it as completed. All right. We have one other ticket that we're going to work in our queue. And this one is says computer crashed. And it's very descriptive, actually. It says here, this morning, my computer crashed and I smell burning plastic. Uh-oh. And then it says, it appears to be working now, but not sure if this needs to be looked at. So I get this comment a lot, or a question, I should say, but it's a comment on my YouTube video, specifically this one here, where I was testing a bad power supply after burning smell and unexpected shutdown. And this is the reason why I created this ticket, because I got this idea. And also, I had somebody else on Discord uh, share their experience as well, and I'll show you some images of that. But I get this question on this specific video, and... Um, what happens is usually power supply usually capacitor kind of blows or you know something overheats within the power supply and that happens sometimes due to the uh, fact that power supply was over exerted meaning that you for example added uh, more stuff to it for example a gpu or you overclocked your computer or something like that and it just wasn't capable of handling that type of a draw, type of a wattage draw, and things start to blow. Another reason for that is that um, these capacitors, for example, this gentleman here shared his um, picture of his open uh, power supply. These capacitors in here uh, will basically, or not just the capacitors, but the everything, the electronics over time when they're exposed to air and just environment, humidity, all of this stuff, they start to erode. Um, or corrode, I should say, not erode necessarily, corrode. Uh, and these capacitors can start to blow, which is the most common thing. Capacitors are kind of like batteries. They hold a charge in them. And if they can't hold charge properly uh, over time because of the corrosion or, or whatever else, there might be a reason, uh, they will start to bulge and they would uh, start to leak. The example we're looking at here from this gentleman's... Um, or these are perfectly fine capacitors. What you see, the white stuff here, this goop, 
the goopy stuff that's normal that's just um, adhesive it's glue that's used for capacitors capacitors uh, they use this glue around the capacitors and underneath them to prevent them from um, moving uh, from expansion from basically uh, disconnecting because you know they are uh, when you put something under that much when you put something under the voltage and stuff like that it tends to move heat and expand they don't want they want to make sure they don't disconnect from the circuit board that's the way i understand it i'm not um, electrical engineer in any ways but i know some of the basic stuff these are perfectly normal capacitors you can see they're not bulging but you usually see bulging is on top of the capacitor and they would bulge out they would also bulge down too uh, but this it would bulge up and it would basically be like sort of like an x over here and of course if they start to leak they would leak from the top there would be a leak on the top be like a, usually like a circle of it anyways these are normal normal capacitors his issue was um not power supply necessarily but if you do get a power supply that that it smells from smells like burning plastic look at the you can if you feel okay with this you can open it up and and see um see if there are any obvious issues but generally speaking if you smell something burning you want to usually replace the power supply in this case it's actually very interesting he had a wire that was actually burning up maybe it's some kind of a short or something or it's just bad wiring it to me it looks like just bad wiring um, that was done here some kind of a rigged thing that was burning and causing issues and in the end he just basically decided to see this is how he had it he was wondering if he should just you know try to solder it or or, or whatnot uh, but in the end he just decided to get a you know replacement power supply although it's cheap i usually recommend the name brands but in his case this is what he can get and i said in the end well might as well it will be safer than trying to solder you some kind of electrical tape like this or anything like that so going back to our take it in this case it's most likely just bad power supply we would have it replaced and then i'm going to reply to customer and say if i am help desk uh, but if i am desktop support locally or you know just a tech guy i would look at it and myself i would you know take it and look at it and see if the power supply is bad and replace it otherwise i would say um, well you know i would talk to them you know hello it sounds like you have a bad power supply please take your computer to local pc tech to take a look now i'm only saying this because i don't know the exact situation of this person they might be working from home or right not so i you know i gotta give them an option uh, but otherwise i would look at it myself and replace it replace the power supply or if it's under warranty i would contact the vendor and have them come out and have it have them replace the power supply you know if it's a computer under warranty uh, this is what usually happens you just call them and they do it you know it's really easy to replace a power supply your computer may still work even if it blows up something and that's the point of my video here is that what happens is the power supply that i'm testing here is actually this so it's the same thing that happened but it actually still works so i am testing it to check the voltage and it's been two years since i made this but i'm pretty sure i actually found that some of the voltage is not right on some of those pins and that's exactly what happens you still may have a working power supply even if a capacitor goes bad or something like that but you may be getting wrong voltage uh, wrong voltage to the motherboard or any of your computer components which can cause even more damage so this is why it's better to might as well just go ahead and just get a replacement power supply even if it's just something you know fairly cheap like this no name um, you know that's better than trying to risk it and cause more damage to your computer all right moving on so 
In this video, we have a couple of different issues. The first one is RDP sound issue, and then we have another ticket for a local admin account that is not working. By the way, if you have one second, please click the like button. That also makes a big difference for my videos and also helps other people see this video because they can see that there is an interaction on the video itself. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so let's look at the first ticket we have here, and that's RDP sound issues. It says here, hi, I use remote desktop to access my second PC, but audio coming from that computer is not working. So there are a couple of reasons why somebody would want to have a second PC and use a remote desktop. And the first one is... They literally have a second PC which has specific software, specific documents, specific files, this and that, and they have a second PC that they want to access. And the only way for them to do it, especially in a business type of environment, is using regular Microsoft built-in remote desktop. The other reason is that somebody literally has a second computer as part of their job to process um, certain files, maybe databases, or do certain processes that require extra CPU power, you know, this and that. You know, maybe there are other reasons as well, but those are just a couple of examples of somebody using a second PC and using it via remote desktop. So he's using remote desktop to access this second PC, but he can't hear any audio coming from that. So it's kind of like this. You see in this computer here where I'm basically recording this, you can see that the name of my computer here is Tech Support. This Tech Support computer is a remote desktop session. So if I play any audio on here, for example, I go to YouTube and I play a video, um, I'm not able to hear any audio. And that's his problem here. So we can fix that. So first thing we have to do is open up remote desktop session on user's computer on his computers on mike's computer we open up a remote desktop session and then we click here show options we're going to expand options and uh, we're going to go to the third tab where it says here local resources and the first thing that comes up is remote audio so we're going to click on settings where it says here configure remote audio settings so this is exactly where we need to go so we're going to click on settings so this computer here is, uh, well, this remote desktop session is set up to play audio on this computer. So by default, it's set like this. If I was to use a remote desktop session on this computer to connect to a second computer over there, um, it will play audio from that computer on my computer. Okay. I don't want this to sound too confusing, but let me just show you. So if I go to youtube.com forward slash kobo man it's going to okay my first time going to my own channel on this computer anyways any audio that you see here right now is actually being played on the remote computer itself that's exactly what his problem is so in order to fix that we have to make sure that its settings are set to this play on this computer otherwise we can't hear this voice at all as you can so right now on my computer which is here where it says tech support i'm using remote desktop right now it's set to play audio on the other computer which is this setting so on the second pc wherever it may be this is what it's set like right now on my computer that I'm using right now. It's playing on remote computer right now. So to fix this, we have to make sure that it's set to play on this computer, which should be set by default. And, uh, and, and that's fine. This is how we would fix that. But I also want to show you something else. So let me complete that ticket. And we're going to come back to this because I really want to talk about something here that's going to be also related to troubleshooting. Very important. And let's wrap this up so we're just going to add internal note and say change remote desktop settings to play audio audio on a local computer 
okay and then we're gonna of course have them test it you know this and that that's fine this should be easy ticket and then we're going to close it of course of course don't forget to assign ticket to yourself as well very important so you can get credit before you close it and since we know mike mike moser we've worked with him many many times uh, we're going to just close it. We're going to let him know, hey, it should be fine now. So we're done with Mike. But I do want to go back to that remote desktop connection to show you something very, very important. So let me explain what I mean. If you get a ticket that a user cannot use their local headset, for example, they have a headset somewhere, their user is somewhere else, and you need to troubleshoot their headset sound issues, and you can't because if you use remote desktop session let's say you're limited to only using remote desktop session it's going to look just like this you remote into their computer just like i am connected to this tech support computer right now and it's going to look like this it's just going to say remote audio there is no headset to select there is no audio to troubleshoot here let me show you if i go to sound settings here it just says remote audio there is nothing else there is no headset to select so you would assume that something is wrong right well, that's, that's not right. The, the problem is, is actually this. You have to go to local resources before you connect to that computer. You have to go to local resources on your remote desktop session, click settings and select play on remote computer, just like we had it previously. And then you go in and then you type in user's computer name, you click connect and then and then we can make changes to the local see now it's looking looking like it's different uh it made <laughs> it made different settings here you see now we can select speakers that are real tech which is the typical uh you see how i got confused because i made the change right away it took a little bit to configure but yeah now we can actually see that there's real tech uh, definition audio same thing if i go over there and plug in a headset you will see it come up as well. All right. So you probably saw, you probably saw that I plugged it in. Now we can troubleshoot that headset on that remote computer. So you would just say to the user or ask them to plug in their headset if it's not showing up like that, and then you'll be able to do it. Otherwise, if you don't change it to play on the local computer like i showed you you won't be able to troubleshoot it and you will just assume that there is something wrong with the audio you know you have to make sure that it's set play on remote computer you know otherwise it's you won't be able to troubleshoot it so that's something to keep in mind if you only have remote desktop connection as the available resource of taking control of somebody's computer and troubleshooting these type of issues all right I hope that comes off as something that you can easily follow because it is kind of confusing and but it is what it is this is how you have to kind of go about it and to to troubleshoot some of these weird issues that might come up okay dokie all right so let's look at this other ticket it says my local admin account is not working and it specifically says here hello i have a local admin account to make changes on my pc but it's not working thanks Larry. so this guy was given specific local admin account to use for some reason and of course uh, don't ever if you have if you have the ability don't ever give somebody a local admin account password uh, because of the security reasons you we have to you know double and triple check to make sure that this person is actually allowed so we're going to go with that assumption all right let's assign the ticket to ourselves we're going to work that we're going to contact him and ask him hey what is the name of the local admin account that you're trying to use so and then he tells you what the name is and then we're going to search for it in on our computer now this is not to be confused with the main admin accounts those are different they will not be listed under local admin users so we're going to just type in users here to get to the point where we can add or edit and see which users or which accounts are available there to begin with this is just one way of looking at this this shows you some administrator accounts and the other way is if you go to the system settings or system properties and then we look at advanced system settings and then we click on user profiles we're going to see all the accounts that are listed here however there is a big difference here what we're looking at we're looking at two very different things 
And I want to kind of emphasize this. This is why I created this uh, fictitious ticket, is that what we're looking at here is local accounts that are on the computer. When it comes to this window here, this is where you would add them. These are all the actual account login information that's available on this computer. Now, what we are looking at here is actually user profiles that are stored. So this is location or this is how much space is taken up by creating a local profile on the C drive. This is not a this is not information for this person's for any of these accounts. This is just what's stored locally. And the thing is though although that describes this if you were to click and delete this profile it would delete it everything that's in stored on this computer meaning all of these things are located on the c drive so if you go to local users on the c drive so c users you can see that they are here here is the buco which is the first one here's the cobalman test account which is this one and here's the yt login is this one so if i click delete on any of these which I can't delete this one. This one never shows up uh, if you're using it. Uh, it's kind of bizarre, but this one is actually on here as well. It's not showing up. I don't know if that's some kind of a feature of Windows, but this YT login actually does exist on this computer as well because I'm using it right now, but yet it's not listed, and I know it's an admin account. It doesn't matter. Getting back to the point of what I'm talking about here. If I select, for example, this one, BUCO, and then I select Delete, it will delete everything that's inside of this folder. So anything that's inside of here, desktop, documents, everything, everything will be deleted. Okay, now that we understand what that is, we're going to cancel out of this. I'm going to leave this window open here because we're going to get back to it. What we're going to do, what I actually wanted you to learn from this fictional ticket um, is what happens when you can create when you create a local admin account or try to use another account on a computer um, to troubleshoot issues for example let's say you need to use an admin account to fix something or to run specific application this is what happens when you do that so what we're going to do here we're going to create a local uh, microsoft account and we're going to name it local admin not a very secure name but it doesn't matter because you know this is just for practice and it's forcing me to do all this stuff now okay so now we have another local admin we're going to change type to administrator so this is just the standard user. We're going to change it to administrator. Now we have a local uh, local account that's administrator account. However, if you go to the settings here in user profile, you can see that it's not there. There's nothing there. And then if we go to the root of C again, we know we have the local profile. We go to root of C, we go to users. It's not there. Well, why is that? Because I want you to know that this completely separates this account from the stored data on the computer in the sense that there is no local profile created only a local admin account so it's only local admin account until you log in to this computer for the first time or or if you use for example your own local admin account whether it's domain or local it doesn't matter let's say you're troubleshooting something let's say you're troubleshooting something and you want to run for example this google chrome as administrator in order to troubleshoot some things you can literally right click this icon and click run as administrator and on a business restricted computer um, you will get a pop-up to log in to use your local credentials but since i'm already logged in as admin on their another account it's not going to give me that so what i'm going to do is hold shift right click this google chrome icon so i'm holding shift key on the keyboard and now we have an option to run it as different user otherwise it doesn't show up run as different user doesn't show up here let me show you right click it's just run as administrator but if i shift right click 
run as different user so that's where we're going to select i apologize this is this is just a glitch here run as different user this is just a scaling issue with my uh with my monitor but it's basically asking me here to put in my login credentials so we're going to do we're going to use this local admin so it's same thing if you have a domain admin you would type in the same login id so we're gonna your your own local id or your your domain admin id i'm sorry so but in this case we're going to use this one so we're going to type in local admin so if i tab over it's actually in the password space i'm sorry you can't see it it's because of the scaling on this 4k monitor and using remote desktop session specifically so if i click ok i've typed in local admin and the password below you just can't see it and i'm just going to click ok and now it's going to run chrome under that specific account under that specific local administrator account so this is useful if you're trying to update the computer and you need to use your own administrator login so right now this specific window and only this window is running under that local admin and separately from this other ticket window it's run separately to prove it to you we're going to go back to our folder and we can see now that there is a local admin <clears throat> profile created because we use that local admin to run as as admin on this computer so it actually actually had to create settings folder inside of that you can see that you see so this is how these things work and let me show you this here we don't need this here anymore but i want to go back to here user profiles now when we click on user profiles we can see that local admin show up and it's right there and you can see it's only 78 megabytes that's very very tiny and usually when a user logs in for the first time into computer it's going to create a much larger local profile but the reason this one here is only 78 megabytes is because it only created a basic sort of like a template information for this local admin profile on this computer just so we can run and store settings for chrome okay and then we're going to let me see if i can open it here and we're going to and here it is you can see that there's some basic documents here and then there's app data and then if we go to for example local google chrome folder is there al along with microsoft it's just the basic microsoft stuff that comes with default um, default settings for the microsoft operating system but it has that google chrome that we just opened you see that and it says 98 megabytes but that's because you know it by the time we opened it up google chrome itself had actually you know stored some data on its own this and that and uh, <laughs> so that's how that works but the great thing about this if you have somebody a remote user who's never logged in to a computer before let's say somebody takes their computer home and they can't log into it for some reason but you have remote desktop access to it uh, you can uh, basically do the same thing to get it going so uh, it, it's kind of a workaround but uh it and it's kind of confusing i know but as long as you can get this local at local profile uh, created and get it going that way when somebody locks their computer they can literally type in the same thing and just get access to this without having to be connected to the network in order to log into this computer for the first time okay that was quite a bit and i hope this wasn't too confusing hopefully it gives you an idea of what's going on with these profiles and again whether it's a local profile or domain profile it's going to act the same way if you run it as admin or run as different user but this is what happens in the background while you're doing all of this stuff okay so i'm just going to reply to customer and say hello larry i've created a local admin profile named local 
admin and the password is you know xxxxx whatever this is not necessarily what you want to do because then everybody will see it matter of fact i would just tell them what it is but we're i'm just going to pretend like we're doing this which you shouldn't necessarily do at all because you know whoever looks at your ticket and god knows how many people they'll know what the local admin uh, login id is and password so you might want to just you know tell him or i don't know whatever the, the 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 settings are or whatever the setup or requirements are for the company uh, when it comes to dealing with you know giving out passwords like this and login ids as well all right guys i hope you like this video please take a moment to like share and leave a comment let me know if you have any ideas for future videos and i'll see you next time bye bye